Welcome to the channel. Remember RAID BDU shirts? They're that missing step between the post-Vietnam 1980s, 1990s US BDU shirt and the current issue ACU or Army Combat Uniform shirt. RAID shirts began uh, to appear in the early 2000s um, and they all had similar sorts of features, although there was no such thing as a standardized RAID BDU shirt, mainly because it was never a, a centrally organized from logistics uh, sort of item. It was actually just something that was designed in the field by individuals who were in theater as they discovered problems with their issue shirts and their issue body armor. Now, talking about body armor, uh, when we think back to the Vietnam era, of course they had body armor then, but uh, that was more in the form of fragmentation vests, soft Kevlar panels, they could flex and move a little bit uh, with the body movement, um, and they didn't cause problems with uh, pressure against uh, buttons and other things pressing onto the body. Um, even in the 1980s, 1990s, with the updated version of that splinter vest, so that's the Pasquet uh, splinter or fragmentation vest, the one in the Woodland Cordura cover, still, effectively, the body armor was in the form of soft Kevlar panels, and um, this was issued uh, and used even into 1993, for example, um, thinking about the Somalia uh, theater, the Battle of Mogadishu in 1993, and in films popularizing that, um, like Black Hawk Down, the people there were mostly wearing uh, Pasquet splinter vests. Now, the US was involved in the NATO deplo deployment in the Balkans in order to stabilize the area. This was um, known operationally, I suppose, as S4 and K4. And uh, this was from the mid-1990s, so 1995, 1996. The thing that was notable about this was that the European militaries that were involved uh, were wearing Bristol armor. Bristol armor is the hard plates, the ceramic plates, that were designed not just to stop uh, splinters and fragments, but actually to stop penetration from direct hits from 7.62, 5.56 and 9mm um, bullets. Um, of course, that meant that the US also upgraded their armor away from the Pasquet splinter vest into the interceptor body armor vest, which could take both Bristol plates, front and rear, and also the soft armor panels. The idea being that the entire package would be the most protective because not only would you have splinter protection on the more movable parts of the body, so um, for example, towards the arms, over the shoulders, um, and maybe closer to the waist, but you'd also have a Bristol plate front and rear to protect the center mass of so the heart, vital organs, well, that sort of thing. So this combination of soft armor and hard armor was going to be the most protective package for uh, people who were basically doing foot patrols uh, and needed this level of protection. With the introduction of the Bristol armor in the interceptor vests, of course, people found that their standard issue BDU shirts, um, that's to say with the buttons um, unchanged designed since the Vietnam War, really, uh, plastic buttons, um, and the uh, standard traditional collar, which I suppose was there to help um, make people look neat and tidy when they were on garrison uh, duty. That, that was not really the most useful thing um, when worn in combination with these hard plates. And so if you fast forward to the early 2000s, um, and that's the uh, war against terror deployment. That was a rush deployment in 2003. The American uh, logistics um, infrastructure was not actually prepared to deal with the demand of such a large de deployment all straight away with people all needing uh, person, you know, personal equipment in large scale. And so what happened was that uh, people got given allowances to go and purchase their own gear. 
uh, as they needed it, if they were going to be deployed in theatre. Uh, this wasn't just in the US, but also in the UK. People actually did get allowance to buy their own stuff. And with that level of personal equipment, so moving away from standardization, came the realization that actually, if you already had different equipment uh, for other uh, requirements, maybe your own socks or your own, um, I don't know, canteen, Nalgene, you know, bottle, pouch, whatever, then why not also change aspects of your uniform? That's to say the really uncomfortable ones. Uh, and so people actually started experimenting. They took away the worst parts, that's um, the buttons that pressed so hard against their bodies when they wore the hard armor that they were actually getting sores and bruises and you know putting on vests the next day was literally like punching a bruise over and over and over again and it was actually causing the sorts of problems that you know meant people were not really able to deploy so there is no such thing as a standardized raid BDU shirt because different people experience the problems differently but there were um, similarities across the board so um, I've got with me here a Vietnam era jungle jacket a uh, bit of a classic that one uh, four pocket design um, and I've got with here with me a raid BDU shirt uh, raid BDU style uh, because this was actually manufactured after but incorporates uh, many of the most popular designs. Sadly, I haven't got one of the 1980s uh, original shirts, but I think the Vietnam shirt is similar enough in all the important ways that it can serve as a good uh, model and a good comparison. So, what sort of features were to be found in these RAID BDU shirts, generally speaking? they'd modify the collar. I mean, if you were going to wear a, 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 a Bristol body armor vest, it would probably come up right up to the neck, almost to the neck. There was an additional neck protector so that you wouldn't feel choked, I suppose. But it would be coming up quite high. There was no need to have this style of collar, which probably looks neater, um, much more traditional, when you're just on, you know, at the barracks or something, but a little bit useless if you actually had to wear all this body armor and it was actually better to have some material um, around the neck that meant that uh, if there was any cordura uh, that might be quite uncomfortable, quite rub against the skin quite a lot, especially in, in hot environments, then having a bit of fabric from the shirt to mitigate that was actually quite nice. And what they would do is they would also add a little bit of Velcro over the top, so you could actually go all the way around. They call this a mandarin collar. The fabric would stand up, and it would automatically help to protect the neck area. Um, another thing they did, generally, as a rule of thumb, the buttons would be gone. So, looking at the Vietnam shirt, and this was the same on the 1980s BDU shirts as well, you'd have buttons running all the way up the body. So. Here we have four, and there's a, I think, a further one up top. And these were quite large, fine, but they also created problems, especially on the, the upper, the chest, upper chest area. Um, when you had hard armor pressing against that, that was hugely uncomfortable. And so on the raid shirts, that was gone. And it would often be replaced with a central zipper like so, because that caused fewer problems. It was less of a pressure point. Um, it was just one seam running up, and that was fine. On the same theme, the chest pockets, which in the earlier shirts were closed with buttons, two buttons each, just like the Vietnam shirt, actually. These were also gone. Um, I mean, the presence of five pressure points in the upper chest area, exactly where the bristle armour probably pressed against the body, was too much to bear. And so, on a raid shirt, what you would find was that the pockets 
would be flattened so any extra pleats would be got rid of so that you just have a single layer of fabric and that would reduce uh, heat and pressure points there and particularly the buttons would be replaced with velcro so there will be no pressure points along any of this area another distinguishing feature was the presence of upper arm pockets so when wearing a large bristol vest trying to get to chest pockets is just about impossible there's really no point having the chest pockets you're never going to get to them and even if you put something in them chances were that whatever you put in them would press against the body and it would be deeply uncomfortable anyway but you could get to the upper arms reasonably easily you could reach over the vest and get in left or right arm didn't matter but that made these upper arm pockets far more useful even than the lower um, waist pockets and often in this one the lower waist pockets have been kept but often um, in order to find material uh, from somewhere soldiers would actually take the lower the lower pockets uh, off and they would actually just put them on the arms and that was it um, it was also helpful because often the shirts we worn tucked in um, that helped to reduce the amount of fabric uh, flapping about underneath the vest. Uh, finally, one something that was very popular, um, I can't show you on the Vietnam shirt because it doesn't have any, but the uh, 1980s BDUs have got a, an extra layer of fabric on the elbows. And this would get opened up for a certain length and a bit of Velcro inserted so you could open up the elbows in order to insert foam padding. Very useful if you're going, if you're going to end up um, putting your elbows on some sharp rocks or something like that. It was uh, much better to do so with some foam padding in between. So those were the primary features of most RAID BDUs. Um, everyone, of course, had their own style. Some people would add a little Velcro across the top for name tapes or on the, on the front of the uh, arm pockets and that would uh, mean that they could attach the insignia on there really quickly instead of having to sew every single bit on. Um, some like to have the commando style rank tab in the middle. Um, some added uh, loops here and there that could be used for extra, extra gear if they weren't wearing their vests but that was highly optional. Uh, some would add a pen pocket on the uh, left sleeve. Little utili utilities and, and uh, useful bits and pieces like that. Um, just to make life easier when wearing a large Bristol armour vest, doing foot patrols and having to take notes or um, you know, s store items in, w in ways that could be easily reached. So. What was the main innovation that made all this modification possible in the first place? Well, it was that new technology, and I'll point it out to you. It's, it's this stuff. Hook and loop, self-adhesive, otherwise known as Velcro. Now, Velcro had been around for quite a while before the early 2000s, um, and it was used in all sorts of applications, trainers, nappies, uh, sports gear, all sorts of stuff. Uh, people were well, well and truly familiar with it in their day-to-day -day lives. But the US military had not really uh, caught up with that trend. And they were still using buttons much as they did in the 1970s. So I guess this is a tribute to all those innovators and inventors, people faced with a situation out in the field, having to come up with solutions for something that the military, logistics, planning, design uh, people never imagined would be a problem. Um, thank you very much, people. You've designed a, a really great shirt, and the proof of that is that many of the designs have been incorporated into the current issue ACU shirts, the Army Combat Uniform shirts, as we all know with the mandarin colours, um, upper arm pockets, um, you know, elbows that open up, all these features are, that we are familiar with now in our uh, 
ACU Army Combat Uniform or British PCS shirts. They all came about uh, from the innovations and inventiveness of people who made raid BDU shirts. So thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed it and see you next time.